Welcome to Faces of Race. I'm Roy Wood Jr. This is my pocket square. My guest today is a wonderful, wonderful woman. She, her, her work with her company has probably straightened out a lot of corporations. We're gonna get into that a little later. She is the CEO of Diversity Inc., Carolyn Johnson. This is my emotional turn to you. How are you doing? <laughs> How? Are you doing? That's a loaded question. We'll get to that answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, during Black History Month and all of the speaking engagements that I'm thinking about, I am mentally exhausted <laughs> but excited all at the same time. So your company, Diversity Inc., essentially helps to educate companies on the fiscal benefits mm -hmm. of diversity. Yes. You know, I've been told on this internet, I don't know if you ever heard of the internet, but I've been checking it out. I just mm -hmm. got into it. Um, but apparently if your company's more diverse, there's benefits to that. And what, what are some of those benefits for corporations? Uh, so yes, Roy, the, the mission of Diversity Inc. is to provide education and clarity on the business benefits of diversity because we know that it can get a little unclear depending on who the messenger is, right? And so when you have a more diverse workforce, um, a more diverse executive leadership team and board of directors, and the phrase people of color is thrown around a lot, but you and I talked about this pre-show, and we know that we don't typically like that. So who are we talking about when we say people of color? We're talking about black people, Latinos, Asians, Native Americans, and then also people who identify as two or more races. So when you hear that, that's who we're talking about. Um, and when we hear diversity, we also want to be very clear. This is not just about women, right? Because affirmative action has benefited white women more than any other group, even though that wasn't the intended group. Diversity is not just about women. Diversity is about ethnicity, orientation, uh, gender, ability, both seen and unseen, but also class. And so we've got to be mindful of what we're talking about when we say business benefits of diversity. Now, how does that help you? Well, um, there are research reports from um, MSCI, Bloomberg, Thomson Reuters, all of the respected data houses where when you have more diverse workforce, executive leadership team, that means that you're more profitable, and when I say profitable, I mean your shareholders get more money and you lose less money. The Center for American Progress in 19, um, from 1998 to then 2018, they ran a, re a research report. And this is data that people claim we didn't have before. And that report said that corporations lost, uh, what is it, $64 billion in regrettable loss. Regrettable loss meaning that people left the company voluntarily because of discrimination. What happens when people leave? They sue. Lack of communication well, and information transfer. So now you've got to go recreate the wheel. Now you've got generations, what, seven generations in the workplace that are not talking. And so it creates a huge problem for a company. So it's not just um, the right thing to do. It's about sustainability, competitive advantage, and profitability. And it ultimately leads to that. But you all have figured out a way to do something that I thought, at least up until this point, wasn't quantifiable, which is to calculate mm. diversity. Because you know, when you talk about racism and yeah. sexism, mm. it moves, it's like smoke. It's there, but it's not, and it moves around, and it's hard to really point it out sometimes because mm -hmm. it's, it's hidden behind all of these different words and stuff. Intentionally. That, that too. So when the companies come to you, well, first off, and this is just for the people who don't completely understand the process. Mm -hmm. A company comes to you and they go, help, I'm racist. Help. <laughs> is that, is, I'm sure the email is worded differently than that. <laughs> but when you sit down with these corporations mm -hmm. and, and they basically open the books to you and go, vet us, right. show us where we're wrong. Right. How difficult is it to have those initial conversations to go, here's where your potholes are mm. because you have to be I, I would imagine the cornerstone of your organization is blunt honesty because yeah. if you're not honest they're not going to be able to fix anything like right. you can't come in and go oh everything right. okay make sure you do some quad put up some quads of decoration uh, like you can't do that to fix diversity or, you know, but how do you have those difficult initial conversations with companies so i think it starts um at the beginning like how diversity came you got it started right so 
um, Luke Visconti, my current uh, founder, chairman of Diversity Inc., um, who I have a great relationship with, right? So let's put a pin in that because that's extremely important when you're talking about eventually getting to that profit, why people won't leave. You have to have a relationship with your workforce. You have to have a relationship with your black people. And I'm focusing there right now because it's Black History Month, so I have that right. Um, and so when Luke started Diversity Inc., he understood from being a recruiter in the Navy that we were running out of white men. And what do I mean by that? We needed to figure out how to get other people into the pipeline to be able to defend our country. I mean, I think that if you, if you start with that understanding at a government level, um, and you understand how blunt the government is and the truth telling that it can do, doesn't always do, but can do, bringing his experience into the corporate arena, um, that was brilliant. And so he understood that it wasn't a function of that black people and um, non-whites were less capable they were just viewed differently, right? White man shows up, the perception is that he is prepared, right? He is plug and play. White woman shows up, maybe she needs a little work, but she is almost as equally as prepared. Everybody else, they need to be trained and molded and oh, they've gotta show us that they can do it first. And so Luke, from his time being a Navy recruiter to starting Diversity Inc, understood what to look at. Think about it, you've got to go through a whole lot to become an aviator. Right? And so he understood what to look for, and then he took that knowledge and he started Diversity Inc. to help corporations understand what to look for. How do the companies, what's, what's, a, what's a better way to, well, no, I can be blunt with you, you're being real. Yeah, keep it real. Face is a race. Mm -hmm. Are you able to sniff out the companies that are doing performative PR for the sake of, look, everyone, we like black people. Was that good enough to be mm -hmm. doing a good job? Versus the companies that are, intrinsically concerned yes. with changing their, essentially you almost have to rewire the DNA of your organization mm -hmm. to have an open eye to diversity. Right. Like you almost have to see it to even see where the holes are that you need to start plugging. Yeah. So are you able to see which companies are basically faking the funk? Yes, absolutely. And um, so I'm, I'm just going to like uh, you know, underline this. What I'm about to share is for folks who are thinking about where they should go work, where they should invest, or where they should stay working, right? So uh, ask yourself a couple of questions. Um, when things happen to your community, and I don't care who you are, right? When things happen to your community, do you have a, and mind you, our Diversity Inc. Top 50 data is really focused on U.S. operations. We don't look globally, right? Do you have a leader that will tell the truth about what went wrong? That's, that right there is the, the first thing to look at. And then where we come in is, if you are not willing to give us the data that we ask for, not the data you want to give us, not the data that look, makes you look good, um, if you are not willing to give us the data that we are asking for to be able to give you a true, honest, comparative assessment. Comparative is important because it's not about how good you are compared to yourself last year when you even sucked then, right? Comparatively, best in class, how do you measure up? It's like when I talk to my doctor and he'd be like, You've been eating healthy? And I'd be like, I eat donuts less. <laughs> Listen, but at least you're honest. Some of them don't even want to be honest about that. I had a salad one month. <laughs> yeah, and so it, we look specifically at six areas um, through the Diversity Inc. annual competition, which is company-submitted data. So this is not us looking on, you know, Glassdoor to see how people feel about a company because they got a bad review from their manager. The company gives us this data. Which companies, you ask? major employers in the U.S. that have a thousand employees or more. So we're talking Fortune 300, 200? We're, we're talking about Fortune 100. You're talking about AT&T, Johnson & Johnson, Hilton Marriott, EY, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Accenture, major corporate brands that are actively trying to recruit people who look like you and I because they have a different set of information that they're working with. And so these companies give us data on their human capital, and it's not just total workforce, right? We want to see, and I know this is going to you know, offend some people, but we want to see, is your company a plantation, right? Are all of the people who are you know, black and brown working in the bottom of the company, while everybody who is not black and brown, who is not of privilege, is in the C-suite, is on the board? So that's the first thing we look for. Levels of management, how you're moving people into the company, how you're developing them to be part of your succession plan. Um, that's the first place we look, right? Then we also look at your talent development programs, who's being mentored, who's being sponsored. And I mean formally. I don't mean, hey, I saw you, we had a cup of coffee, so I'm your mentor. 
But when it comes time for somebody to get promoted or be on, you know, stretch team assignments, it's not the people that you would want to see there if you have a strong program for diversity. We also look at benefits. Um, if you think about student loan debt and how people are not able to go to school right now because of the global pandemic, COVID-19, how are you making sure that people can invest in themselves while they're with you and even if they should choose to leave you, right? We look at supplier diversity. How are you impacting the smaller businesses around you um, that are not, you know, the country club, club relationships, right? Um, you know, you think about the number of businesses that were opened by black women since this pandemic started. They're leaving corporate America and starting their own business. I wonder why, Roy. And then last but certainly not least, we look at philanthropy. Because it's not just about what you do for your workforce, it's about how you are giving to those who don't have, and it's not because they did something wrong, it's just far more often than not because of their zip code, the color of their skin, and who their parents are not. So those are the things that we look at at our Diversity Inc. Top 50 competition. Company submitted data, a lot of corporations participate, CEOs call me and ask me, well, what should I do now? You're, you're interesting to me because you essentially take on a battle that a lot of black people just in casual conversation will not take on. Just the casual, when we, like, when we talk about the concept of allyship, mm -hmm. right? And we talk about white people doing the work and going off on their own and studying and mm -hmm. there's plenty of books you can read, there's plenty of classes you can take to educate yourself on just the base one-on-one -on -one level of how not to be racist and how not to be biased in the workplace, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of black folks just go, look, I'm not gonna have that conversation with you, right. it's stressful, I'm stressed, go handle that, come back to me when you got some knowledge. Right. Instead of taking that path, you just run a whole company that does those conversations. Mm -hmm. How do you wake up every day and engage in that in a world where there's still, th it's still maddening to be black? Mm. Uh, so there's, I have a two part uh, response to that. So the first is because I have data to see that we are making progress, right? So if you think about the uh, 200 questions that produce 1800 data points, right? Um, I see that when companies are executing and taking this work seriously, that we are seeing people be treated fairly in the workplace, right? Um, so that's, that's, that's half of it. Uh, the other part of it is because I believe in people. I don't believe that people are inherently bad. I believe that they're taught to not care about other people. And so that data, married with the understanding that people are not intentionally bad, that is what gets me up in the morning. I have the data to understand that people can do better when leadership is involved and engaged and that black people are not the problem, right? Leaders are the problem. Bad corporate policy is the problem. Uh, community policing is the problem. Think about this. And I love, uh, I love Randall Stevenson. He was the CEO of AT&T and he was also the board chair because he tells the truth, right? Right after George Floyd was murdered, he went on, C and on um, CNBC and he, he was being interviewed. And of all the great points he made, this one stuck out to me. He said, if you think about community policing as it relates to black people, if we took those same policies and used them in a corporation, we would be sued and the individual or individuals would be fired and rightfully so. So how can you expect a person to drive off of their corporate campus and be treated the exact opposite way of how we expect them to be treated. That is the difference between companies that are sustainable, have a, a different kind of welcome mat or invitation to work there, than companies that just say, they're bad, we're good, next, because their stock price for that particular period is up. Malcolm X said, Oh, no, oh shoot now, <laughs> you about to get us in trouble. He said, he said a lot of things. <laughs> But amongst some of the many things that <laughs> the most disrespected person in America is the black woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why is there, and he said that decades ago. Mm. I don't know the year, but mm. I'm a ballpark at about 50. Mm -hmm. Why is that still true? <sighs> and why do you think companies, it, it, it's like a, this could be a nine-part question if mm. I wanted it to be, but I'm gonna try and keep it to two. Mm. Why do you think that is still true, and why do companies still have this blind spot for black women? Like we just said, black women are just going, y'all can have this company. I'm gonna go start my own thing. Mm -hmm. Why? Why are black women so ignored? 
So I think about um, I think about the relationship that I have with my mother, and I think about the relationship that I now have with my own kids, my eight-year-old, my four-year-old, and I am I took my mother for granted, right? And my mother's a black woman, in case you think I'm mixed or something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I identify as black, but we know I'm not all anything, right? <laughs> and then I think about how um, it is just. When, when somebody pours into you and they love you. It is just the nature to take them for granted. And make no mistake about it, black women are the mothers of this country. We set the tone for morale in corporations. And it's just that nature of those who will always save you to treat them the worst sometimes and to take them for granted. And that's what happens with black women. And we give so much grace because we believe in people, because we believe that they have the ability and the desire to get better. Um, but that's why w what we're seeing now will change because they're leaving. Um, unfortunately, if you think about the mass exodus of executive black women from Wells Fargo, right? Think about it. We are getting to a place where we were now well networked, educated, and now we have a choice. We don't have to stay, right? Uh, we've managed our finances properly, so we are not slaves to these corporations. We're giving ourselves options that we didn't give ourselves before. Second. I think that um, they're leaving also because we really are worried about doing what we've seen work, and that is building your own so that your kids have a choice. I want to make sure that my kids don't have to worry about money. I want them to be able to go travel abroad and take a year off after graduation. And that is not going to be done working for somebody who doesn't think I have value beyond muling me. And that's why they're leaving. And that's why I do what every, I do every day, because I want people to know that if you are not white, you're more than a mule. Is there still, as black women gain this level of self-awareness, because you go to school, you get the nice, cute, big, the perception is just, oh, that's a degree, that's cute, but you're mm. still black, and I don't know if you can do it. Right. As the black woman becomes more self-aware of her power, mm. Do you think that comes at a detriment to these corporations? Because eventually they may just, if they're leaving, then I would imagine the next, the next progression is that they just don't apply for the jobs in the first place. Well, I think that you have to do the research, right, to understand why they're leaving, right? Um, and the only way you can do that is to interview them while they're there, right? Um, and you said something that I want to go back to. Uh, right now, people, white people, non-black people, because you got to think about um, you know, when I think about diversity, right, there are a lot of Indian women that are becoming like chief diversity officers, but that were not born here. And so in their country, they were the majority. So th it's a mentality. Privilege is a mentality. It's not always a skin color or a, or a gender, right? And so I think that you have to understand what went wrong. That's the education that you have to do. We, we cannot put this all on white people. I think everybody has to stop and understand that this, if it's going to be solved, is a group lift, right? This is a group effort. This is not just one, uh, it's not black women saving the country, like we seemingly somehow always figure out a way to do. Um, this is about people owning their privilege, whether they were the creators of it or not, right? And this is about us sharing what went wrong with feeling. When I sit and I watch interviews of myself, and I hate doing that, Hopefully, I'll get over it. This one will be great, though. Trust me, <laughs> this will be beautiful. The difference in what lands in the takeaway is how much feeling and how much truth telling I put into that. So, the change that you're seeing, the Stacey Abrams of the world, people are responding to Stacey and to the idea of Kamala because they are feeling it. We are showing up as who we are. We're talking about our pain, but we're also talking about what we're not going to take anymore. That's the difference between walking in the back and holding white women's bags during the women's suffrage movement and where we are now. We are standing out in front. We are talking about what went wrong and we're talking about what we will not let happen again. That's the difference between then and now. You bring up Kamala, the, pardon me, Madam Vice President. Yeah, and I, 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 I feel like I know her. I'm self-correcting. <laughs> Madam Vice President, Madam thank Vice you. <laughs> Kamala Harris. Does her presence now in America well, it, to go back to the 200 
questions that you ask companies to create these data points for yes. diversity. Mm -hmm. How much does representation play a role in informing biases that companies may have? Does Kamala, what I'm basically trying to ask in a roundabout way, mm -hmm. does seeing Kamala on TV, does Kamala's presence now as the vice president, will that have a positive effect on the perception of black women and people, because Kamala is you know, multi-ethnic, yeah. will that have a positive impact? Yes. I, in boardrooms. I, I think, I, I, I'm not even going to say I think it will. I know it will. But it didn't start with her, right? Um, you know, I think if we, if we talk about Carla Harris, right? Um, you know, there, I mean, listen, there, and I mean, I'm not discounting her rise or her current station. She is like rock star awesome, right? Like bow down. But we've been at this for a while. There have been black women doing amazing things in spaces where people said we didn't belong and could never get to. Like Wall Street, right? If you think about Carla Harris and, you know, her work with Morgan Stanley, she taught people a couple of things, that black women are good at math. <laughs> <laughs> really? Uh, Y'all be counting? <laughs> <laughs> no, you got to figure out. Oh, I was about to say something terrible. Never mind. <laughs> um, but Carla Harris, and then I think about, um, and, and then, you know, kind of fast forward real quick, I think about, um, you know, um, Rosalind Brewer. She just became named the CEO of Walgreens, right? Think about these black women. And she saved Starbucks when they were going through this stuff. Think about these clean up women, right? You know, shout out to the late Betty Wright. Think about these women who have been doing this work, laying the foundation for Kamala to make it to where she is. Um, Michelle Obama. People didn't think about black women and Ivy Leagues until Michelle Obama came along and made it a reality, right? Um, this idea that we are not capable does not, cannot stand up to contact, right? Racism cannot stand up to contact. We've got to experience each other. We've got to come together. Companies that have leaders down in the levels where they tried to keep us, that frozen middle, when they're experiencing people, you see something different happen. You see a, a, a different way in which people of color, blacks, Asians, Latinos, and others, you see a difference in how they're treated when we come together, when we're able to show who we really are. And so, again, um, her rise has been a movement in the making for a very long time. <laughs> uh, companies who, so when these, when these companies come to you in an effort to better themselves, mm -hmm. here's a better analogy. So I went to the doctor a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. This is a long time ago. And he goes, well, um, you got sleep apnea, so you got to wear this machine <laughs> till you take a walk or two, mm -hmm. then it'll go away. Mm -hmm. And in my head, I'm going, yes, yes, I will do the machine, and I promise to do yeah. the machine. And I go home, don't wear the machine, mm -hmm. don't do no walking, I ain't wearing no CPAP. Because I. Uh, how do you handle companies who not only reject your data, but also reject some of the solutions that you may present? Mm. Or do you just leave them to their own devices like my doctor did me? Go, You'll figure it out and I mm -hmm. bet you in a year you're going to come back and you don't put that machine on, which mm -hmm. I did. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's sticking with, with, um, with, with your scenario, you hadn't really felt a consequence of not doing it yet, right? Um, That's true. And in thinking about corporations, um, I mean, what typically brings on change, right? And this is just really sad, but it's a reality. A lawsuit. Uh, decrease in stock price, um, um, or if you think about the, the, the network in which they exist in, their competitors are just kicking their you-know-whats. So think about retail, right? I was going to say Twitter, too. When black Twitter get on you. Oh, yeah. but, but that's don't a, you have a social media slip up? But let me tell you, my, my, my friend, um, uh, Drew McCaskill, right, he is just like an amazing marketing mind. Um, he's on Karen Hunter's show all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And Drew has a way of helping us understand the power of our voice. Like, we really just made it so that Chick-fil-A and Popeyes didn't have to do any advertising for a real long time because we were having a fight online about which sandwich is better. I noticed the lines that I'm trying to go home. I don't want fast food. I just want to get around the block. Yep. And so our voices, our impact on how people view the world is so powerful, and we are often the last ones to see that at home, in the community, and most importantly at work, right? And so, you know, I, I just think about the, the fact that um, we really have to make sure that we're staying rooted in the data, right? Um, this is not emotional, right? This is about money, right? Confidence in what is going to work. 
the stock market, I bar, C bar, investor confidence, consumer confidence. We have turned a corner where people are having a different type of confidence in our abilities, our capabilities. Now, I was sharing with you before, um, when I think about passion and purpose, right, um, I had a health scare. And, right, I had um, like maybe three colonoscopies in two months, right? I was feeling terrible. And then I had an interview, it was the end of the year, I had an interview with the CEO of Marriott, Arnie Sorensen. And when I tell you I fought to get there, like I was leaning on my boss to walk to the conference room to do this interview. It was in that moment, and mind you, this was 2019, the end of 2019. When I talked to that man and he said this very thing, I was given the job because I had the opportunity to lead, not the experience. And I was just like, that's what I needed to hear. I fought to get here in this moment to hear one a message that i probably needed to hear for myself as a newly minted ceo but one he talked to me as a peer because i absolutely am we often don't believe in ourselves we create this box this imaginary box that nobody put us in by the way we're just in there and we're like oh well i can't come out because they won't let me never taking a step forward and so that idea that we have to talk about the lack of experience is not something that should hold us back because they stopped us from getting the experience. But when we get a hold of it, and you talked about this earlier, you know, your, your, your beginning was in really like broad, it was in a print and not TV, but here you are now. Correct. It's because we can do anything if we get the opportunity. Because we don't have the experience, but whoo boy, when we get hold of that opportunity, game over, we're winning every single time. And so my purpose and my passion I get people try to recruit me all the time. I'm not going anywhere because I know that I'm doing this work. This is what I was meant to do. There is no other job I would, I would rather have than the one I have today. This is my purpose. So then, I'll end, so then I'll, I'll end with this question then. To that point, what were some of the things that you did mm -hmm. to get yourself into the position to just have the opportunity? Even if you didn't have the experience, are there any key mile markers mm -hmm. that you recall amongst your, your trajectory mm -hmm. that you look back on and go, yeah, that really helped me get into that position? Because I'm sure people that are watching this, there are people mm -hmm. who believe they're in that box. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this may, this may sound, you know, too basic, but step one, listen, right? Um, and, and take down the, the, the defensiveness, right? Because Oftentimes, we miss messages because we're so defensive, it's hard to hear, right? Um, and so um, I'll share a quick story with you, and it's about permission, right? Um, we, w I was in a place where I felt like, and I didn't realize it until it happened, I needed permission to have children. And this is not a black issue. This is an issue that women often face, right? Um, I was in grad school. Um, I was promoted to, CEO, um, to chief operating officer. And I was talking to my boss, and he goes, oh, my God, you're doing such a great job. You would be an awesome mom. Up until that point, I never even thought about having a family because I thought I couldn't not, keep, not have a family and keep my place in line, right? I bust my behind to get to where I was. Have a kid, you know, and then you're looking all crazy. We know that there's a certain look that you have to have, right? So is my body going to bounce back? Am I going to get my place back in line? And I'm a black woman. Think about the intersectional issues that I mentally was battling that stopped me from thinking that I could have a family. In that moment, because my mind evolves like, you know, crazy, when he said that to me, it became clear to me that I could do it. I had four kids in my mind. They all had names. <laughs> but from that point forward, I realized that we sometimes just don't hear permission and feedback to know that we can do anything. So I would tell leaders, give your employees feedback, positive feedback, along with the negative feedback, but give them permission to be successful. That is what a lot of people are waiting for, just permission to win. That's what a lot of people need. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Um, by my calculations, you have two more kids to go. <laughs> No, nah, bro, I'm done. Two down? No Two mas. to go? No. <laughs> the factory is closed. <laughs> Carolyn Johnson, thank you so much for coming on Faces of Race. I appreciate you, and I hope to one day run a corporation large enough <laughs> that needs your company. Well, I hope I don't need you guys. I just want your company to come in and go, you're doing a good job. Good can always get better. You'll need me. <laughs>
fair enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.